It is that time. Um, we want to welcome everyone uh, to, uh, if you want to put up the first slide there, uh, Dr. Wayne. All right, let me share the screen. So I'm first or, oh, I'm sorry, I've got, got the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> so hello, my name is uh, Mario Brown, and I want to welcome everybody to um, This Is Not Normal, Our Last Ship in Advocacy in the Age of COVID-19 Town Hall Series. And our topic uh, for this town hall is responses to xenophobia and hate crimes. Uh, we have a dynamic panel for you, and my job right now is to introduce our facilitator um, and moderator for today's panel, um, Dr. Yun O. Yun, Yun O. Wang. PhD. Uh, Dr. Wang is a member of the marketing faculty at Katz Graduate School of Business uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. His academic interest involves consumer psychology and cross-cultural marketing um, in the global market. Extending these interests, Dr. Wang also promotes diversity and inclusion around the country as a trainer and facilitator. His clients include faculty, staff, and students at colleges and universities, administrators, and athletes at sports organizations, and notably the AACSB, which is the accreditation body for business schools. So once again, welcome, and I would like to turn this over to Dr. Wang. Thank you, Mario. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to be a part of this event, and uh, thank you so much uh, to, uh, for everybody who worked together, like really hard to put together this uh, event. Uh, today, I, like, let me start out with uh, the panelists. So, uh, and let me introduce them, and they will have uh, about 10 minutes of short presentations uh, sharing their thoughts. And after that, uh, okay, we'll go into a uh, lively discussion, and uh, we're going to wrap it up with a QA from the audiences. So, Dr. Hugley is the interim director of the University of Pittsburgh's Center on Race and Social Problems and an assistant professor in Pitt School of Social Work. He is a research to practice scholar focused on school based and parenting interventions that support racial equity and positive developmental outcomes for youth and color. Uh, Dr. Hugley, uh, welcome to the panel and thank you for uh, joining us. And, uh, Second panelist is Dr. Luen Wang. Okay, she's a professor in School of Law, where she teaches contracts, civil procedures, employment, discrimination, and evidence. Uh, her scholarship examines ordinary and extraordinary forms of discrimination and uh, connections between them. Thank you for joining us. And the third panelist is Shayla Martinez. And, she is a Jack and Lobo Olander Professor of Asylum, Refugee, and Immigration Law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. She is also the Director of Clinical Programs and the Immigration Law Clinic. Her academic publications and academic interests include issues related to immigrant women, Puerto Rican migration, Caribbean migration, remittance, uh, legal pedagogy, and outcrit theory. Now, thank you for joining us. Now, our final uh, uh, panelist is Dr. Waverly Duck. He's an urban sociologist, sociologist and associate professor of sociology at the University of Pittsburgh. He's the author of No Way Out, a Precarious Living in the Shadow of Poverty and Drug Dealing, published by University of Chicago Press in 2015, which was a finalist for the C. Wright Mills Book Award. His new book on unconscious racism, passive racism, co-authored with Anne Rawls, is due out in June of 2020 with the University of Chicago Press. So I want to welcome all four of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're going to start out with uh, Dr. Hughley uh, with uh, his presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. 
thank you all for, for having me here. This is a very timely conversation. It's a very difficult conversation, uh, especially in light of recent events and um, that, are, that are impacting so many of our communities. I look at the news every day and I think about this notion of um, post-racial America. You know, we have the election coming up just a few years ago when Obama was first elected. There were many in the media, uh, especially in, in white media outlets saying this is, a, now we're entering a post-racial United States of America. And, you know, lots of us in scholarly and, and activists and communities of color knew that that wasn't accurate. And we're reminded more and more of that every day. And, and people have talked about how COVID really lays bare a lot of the racial issues that are very strong undercurrents in our country. And, you know, just recent events, um, a bird watching black man in Central Park had uh, police called on him uh, for asking someone to leash your dog. And when I was trying to recover from that event as a black man, um, and I do want to say there will be some things in my presentation that uh, well could be uncomfortable. Uh, it's not graphic, but I do bring up things that are that are that are that are tragic and and traumatizing in some ways. So please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. But we are also dealing with the reality of our society uh, that we have to face and try to fight for change in every day. So. You know, just yesterday we saw George Floyd and what happened to him in, in, Minas in Minneapolis was, was truly tragic and, and unbelievable and enraging and disheartening at the same time. And so these racial issues are, are, are in our face every day. And this is after only a couple of weeks after the Ahmaud Arbery video was released. So, you know, as a country, we're reeling in our Asian American community throughout this crisis has been victimized with uh, harassment and attacks. There have been more than 1900 reports of anti-Asian racist attacks since COVID crisis started. And so I wish I could say that word. I'm surprised by this, but uh, I want to go back a little bit in history and, and the two areas I'm going to touch on mainly today is a little bit about race history and a little bit about uh, the lives of youth, which are areas where I, where I focus. And if you didn't know, now you know, <clears throat> America was founded in um, racism and in white, uh, white supremacy. So racism was used to justify the imperialism, the colonialism, the slavery, and um, the other forms of subjugation that established the wealth of this country. United States and, and Western, the Western world basically between maybe 1400s and uh, you know the 2000s have gravitated from mainstream ideas around spiritual racism. You know, at first um, the notion was that we can enslave these people, we can colonize these people because they don't believe in the same God we believe in. Well, when people started changing their religious views, that sort of moved into biological racism. Oh, well, you know what? These people are scientifically inferior to us, so we can oppress them. And when that, you know, when science started pushing back against that, I think we're in a space now, and scholars tend to agree that there's a cultural racism and a white supremacy around people being responsible for their own social scenarios and social situations. And without any sort of acknowledgement of the larger fabric of racism in the in the Western world, and certainly in the United States. And as an illustration of that, one thing I like to share with my students is a little game I like to call name that document. So here's a famous quote, or an infamous quote. It says, he has excited domestic insurrections among us, and has endeavored to to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So this document is calling Native Americans merciless savages. 
und undistinguishing destructors of all types of, of people, and that is in what document the Declaration of Independence. So, and if, and, you know, for those that are skeptical, because the print's so small and the word is so fancily written, no, it's right there, right there. You can go to DC and look at it and, and see for yourself. I was having a very, very good webcast the other day, and one of the speakers said that racism in the United States, you know, people are saying, oh, there's this virus of racism, we have the virus of corona, and we have the virus of racism. And this was Dr. Reed um, came out of Kentucky uh, Theological Seminary in Louisville, and he said that racism in the United States is not a virus, that it's inherent to the American body. If you want to remove racism, you have to fundamentally change the composition of the nation. And so we do work in looking at, at black youth experiences and that's here in Pittsburgh. And uh, we talked to hundreds of black youth about race, their beliefs about race, their experiences with race. And I wanna point out some of the racial undercurrents that we see in our own town. So we have uh, Dr. Ming Tae Wong at the School of Education and myself, we have over 500 survey responses from African American uh, middle and high school youth here in Pittsburgh. 73% of those youth report experiencing racism already. Um, half of them say they've experienced it in school discipline. 38% of high school students say they have experienced discrimination from law enforcement or from security guards already in high school for almost four in 10. And sadly, when we ask middle and high school students if they believe that people in this country value the lives of members of their group, half of them say they do not believe them. They basically do not believe that black lives are valued in the United States, half of our youth. When we look at the Asian American community, national data, they are experiencing racism very frequently and commonly. 63% of Asian American youth report discrimination experiences. And we know from psychology, from education and other domains that in criminal justice, discrimination experiences are overwhelmingly shown to be harmful for you academically, socially, psychologically, across the board. So a lot of times, you know, I think we've had a wake up call with COVID because, you know, I, I go back to the 2008 election and we thought we were post-racial. I think many people still really adopted this model minority idea around, around Asians in, in the United States and that they didn't really experience racism. A lot of people kind of believe that, but the history of racism against Asians in the US is very strong. You had mass murders of Chinese immigrants in the 19th century. You had the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act banning Chinese immigration and that, that meant no more immigration of laborers and that nationalists in the country could not get citizenship. Uh, you had Japanese internment during World War II in the United States. And you know, economic competition and public health concerns have always you hold the white supremacist narrative against Asians and other groups in the United States. These events that I just described were, were economically fueled and sometimes the public health concerns are real. Sometimes they're contrived, but they're, they're false narratives against a certain group of people. Right now, there's survey data out that says that more than 30% of Americans have witnessed um, someone blaming agents for COVID-19. So that's a very, very common belief in our, in our, in our nation today. So um, resources that, that uh, we've been monitoring and thinking about at the Center on Race here at Pitt, you know, there are a few that I'll hit on, I'm sure my colleagues will provide others, but the reporting mechanisms are, are there are a lot. And one, one good one is here, and you can screenshot this slide and have these resources, but you can report these, these incidents as a victim and as a witness. And I want to speak to this a little bit as a, as a witness. Because one of the points of intervention is bystander. Being a bystander and what do you do in these moments or when these things happen? And, you know, a lot of 
anti-racist work talks about what you do in those moments. And there's a guide here. Uh, and then this is a comprehensive resource that has resource that has material in multiple languages for folks. Um, I want to close out talking about parenting and things that, that, that we work on very closely. You have the simultaneous job of protecting your children if you're in the families of color and advocating for change. And so pro proactively promoting positive racial identities is a, is a great thing for, for youth of color and parents should engage in that. Preparing youth for racism they may face and you do that with empathy and affirmation. You know, it can be overwhelming. It can be disheartening to know you're going to face racism. Let them know that they can overcome. In fact, the, the, the histories of people of color are very, very resilient. And you can use those histories to affirm young people. Promote appreciation of all groups. It goes without saying. It's also in the literature. It shows the yield positive developmental outcomes. So it's not just about moral values. It's actually good for kids to appreciate other cultures. You want to protect them against racism, but, but don't promote mistrust of whole groups of people. That's not healthy. It's been proven to be unhealthy across groups. And for white families, tell the true and holistic stories of people of color and of racial subordination in the United States. This is what doesn't happen nearly enough. Uh, and consume diverse media. You know, I do some fun activities with my students, like, you know, how many black movies have you actually seen? And it's such a racial divide, it's not even funny. Um, but on a serious note, what are you doing to normalize black lives, Asian lives, Latinx lives in your home? Diversify your social network. And again, promote appreciation of all groups. Anti-racist teaching yields anti-racist action. So as we grow our anti-racist perspectives in this country, it, you know, we do it as adults. We have to share it with our kids. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to the other speakers. All right, thank you, Jay. Uh, now we're gonna go to uh, Dr. Yuen Wang. Uh, and uh, please share your thoughts. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Hubley, for those powerful remarks, which I think um, connect with some of the things that I'd like to talk about today. And I really want to thank the two offices for organizing this really important program and for inviting me to participate with this really outstanding group of speakers. What I would like to do today is offer a framework for thinking about hate crimes um, that I think can be helpful for figuring out how to respond to hate crimes in a way that will be more effective. Um, and so at the risk of oversimplifying the complex dynamics that are involved in hate crimes, uh, what I would like to talk about is how the harms of hate crimes interact with the um, motivations for committing them. In other words, how the two are connected. Um, and in particular, sorry, my, let me advance my slide. Um, what I am going to talk about is the reciprocal reinforcing relationship between the harms of and the motivations for committing hate crimes. And what I'd like to do first is begin by identifying and then debunking some common assumptions that we have about hate crimes, um, including, um, which I'll get to in um, just a minute, including the view that hate crimes are irrational, um, deviant acts that um, reflect the personal ideologies of the perpetrators rather than what I have come to see them as, which is opportunistic acts that are reflective of more mainstream social influences. And so I'd like to begin by talking first about the harms of hate crimes, which um, some people don't understand, right? So one of the sort of backdrops about talking about hate crimes and one of the sources of controversy in the legal community has been this idea that we shouldn't refer to particular crimes as hate crimes because to do so 
is to say that certain crime victims are more special or more valuable than others. So in other words, this is the view that um, any assault is just an assault, right? All crime victims are um, the same, and so all crimes should be treated equally. And my point with regard to that is that, in fact, hate crimes are more harmful than other crimes, and so we should call them out as a special category of crime. And the reason why is that hate crimes have the social effect of designating particular groups as what I call suitable targets or suitable victims for violence and intimidation. And this designation really has a lot of harm at many levels. So it affects the individual victim of the hate crime, members of the group that identifies with that victim, and also the broader society. So let me just briefly describe the harms for each level. So for the individual victim, recognizing that you have been targeted because of your identity is especially traumatic emotionally and psychologically. It's more traumatic, studies have shown, than being a victim of a random crime because you attribute your victimization to something that you can't change, right? That is a part of you. And that creates the feeling of being uniquely vulnerable, especially vulnerable, right? More vulnerable than other people out in the world. And what that then leads to is victims feeling shame and stigma and um, isolating themselves and even cutting back on mundane daily activities, right? Uh, not going to class, not going to the store, that sort of thing in order to avoid further victimization. And it also leads to a lack of reporting or underreporting um, because uh, people sometimes think I'm not gonna get any help. Sometimes they don't wanna identify as the victim of a hate crime. Um, and so you know, they don't get access to resources that could help them to recover from the trauma. For the group that identifies with the victim, the effects are actually pretty similar. That is, if you recognize that the victim's identity, which you share, was the reason why that person was targeted, that likewise can lead to feelings of isolation and fearfulness um, among members of the target group, even if they themselves are never individually attacked. And it also can lead to isolation and withdrawal by members of the group more broadly. And then finally, at a societal level, hate crimes really harm all of us, right? Even if we are not the individual victim or even um, identify with the victim's group because they really um, bring into sharp relief and exacerbate the divisions among groups. And they also lead others who are not members of the targeted group to try to distance themselves from the group, to try to differentiate themselves from the group, um, and in particular among Asian Americans, what this has led to is members of particular um, Asian ethnicities or national origins trying to distinguish themselves from the particular group that is the target of the moment. And the writer of one op-ed said, um, it's like that old joke about two people running away from a bear, right? The um, joke is you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the other guy. And as the op-ed writer said, except in this case, you don't have to deal with racism, you just have to make people racist at someone else. So that's what um, the special harms are that justify treating hate crimes as worse than, as different from other types of crimes. The motivation side actually is connected with this designation of particular groups as suitable targets. Now, the common assumption is that hate crimes are deviant, right, irrational acts of mentally unstable individuals that reflect their personal beliefs or attitudes or their fringe or extreme ideologies. But in fact, this is really a caricature of the motivations behind the perpetration of hate crimes, really. It's a prototype, right, that we um, identify, but that actually distorts our understanding of why people commit hate crimes. Because the reality is that the perpetrator's bias, the perpetrator's targeting or selecting of someone from a particular group 
is socially reinforced and the perpetrator's acts often are rational, although in a very perverse way, um, because perpetrators frequently are motivated by a desire to obtain, and in fact, they often are successful in obtaining social and even material rewards by targeting members of particular groups. And the social rewards and the psychological rewards that go along with them can be the excitement of choosing a suitable target, um, bonding with peers, and also receiving recognition and even um, sometimes approval from authority figures, right? And that um, leads into another point that is very relevant today. Um, it always is, but it's really on our minds today. And that is that hate crimes are often overlooked or minimized by authority figures and even sometimes are prompted or encouraged by the rhetoric of authority figures. So this, I think, is not going to be a surprise to anyone, um, but recent studies prior to COVID-19 um, showed a high correlation between the rhetoric and election of Donald Trump and a surge in reported hate crimes against um, various groups across the United States. And one pair of researchers speculates that his election, after having engaged in this rhetoric, um, really validated that rhetoric and that perspective, um, you know, gave them legitimacy. And with the pandemic, of course, high level um, government officials, certainly President Trump, um, but also um, others such as his um, trade advisor, Peter Navarro, have identified Asians or people of Asian descent as suitable targets by labeling COVID-19 as the Chinese virus, um, the Wuhan virus, and other even um, more derogatory names. And the key idea that really connects the harms and the motivations, and that I think can be really helpful for thinking about how to respond to hate crimes, is uh, what I'll go back to as the designation of certain groups as suitable targets or suitable victims. And the connection is that perpetrators both depend on and then perpetuate that designation, right? And thereby depend on and then perpetuate the harmful effects of hate crimes. So in other words, the desirability of selecting a victim from a particular social group is tied to past discrimination against that group that has marked the group as suitable targets and in turn perpetrators of new hate crimes continue the pattern by contributing further to a social environment in which targeting particular groups can bring rewards to its perpetrators so that's what i talk about um, and label as the reciprocal reinforcing relationship between the harms of and motivations for hate crimes. So in other words, hate crimes both are influenced by the social context or reflect the influence of the social context and in turn have influence on the social context that designates particular groups as suitable victims. And I think this framework is helpful for thinking about how we can respond to hate crimes effectively because it suggests that what we need to do is disrupt that relationship between the harms and motivations by addressing the harmful effects of hate crimes and by denying perpetrators the rewards that they seek to gain from committing them. So with that in mind, it's been heartening to me to see a couple of things. First, that Far from um, isolating themselves um, and hiding away, you know, withdrawing from the shame and stigma, victims of hate crimes recently have been much more open about sharing their experiences, about publicizing what has happened to them, and about objecting to what is happening to them. In other words, um, we're not going to withdraw, right? We are going to make ourselves visible. And likewise, others, have, and this is the op-ed author that I quoted earlier, 
Others are not distancing or differentiating themselves from the victims, but instead are showing solidarity with them, right? Saying, um, no, we're in this together, right? I'm not going to accept that that group is identified as a target and try to sort of immunize myself from that target. And of course, even as some authority figures are encouraging hate crimes through their um, incitement of anti-Asian sentiment, other officials um, at high levels are denouncing that anti-Asian sentiment. And so that's been really heartening to see. So I will close with words from the op-ed um, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, the words of Yuni Hong, the author of the op-ed piece, who says, the only path forward for any of us requires a united front. And so I'm really happy to be part of this program because I think programs like this do a lot to further that effort. So thank you very much for um, listening to what I have to say. All right, thank you very much, Yuan. And uh, uh, we are going to move to a uh, second legal scholar like in our panel, uh, Dr. Shayla Ellis Martinez. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Let me share my screen. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. I think that this is a a terribly important conversation and as as the as the panelists come through we are all i think feeling uh from from each other what i'm going to try to do today is to talk about the context of the asian american immigrant experience and how and, and how it has evolved throughout the years and like i always say i'm usually the debbie downer um <laughs> Because there's there it's it's a very interesting uh, it's very interesting to see how the Asian American immigrant experience has shaped immigration law probably more than any other than, than any other group. So so I would like to to be able to say that this is not normal like the like the uh, title of the of the series, but unfortunately I'm not able to say so. So. COVID-19 is the disease of social distancing and seclusion, but it's also the disease of transparency. And uh, it has given visibility to structural inequality, fueled by long lasting polities that are based in an aero etereo patriarchal uh, view since the foundation of this country of what this country is and should be. Uh -huh. And that it's very evident in the context of immigration policy and particularly in the context of Asian American uh, immigrant experience. So how did, how did we get here? So originally states regulated migration. There was not a federal immigration law and Chinese immigrants began to come to the United States in large numbers in the 1840s uh, through the gold rush and settle in the, in the western part of the United States, mostly in California, and remained really regulated by state migration. And interestingly, the first federal immigration law, the first attempt of the federal government to exercise control of immigration law was through the Page Act in 1875, and that had a clear intent of excluding Chinese immigrants, in particular, in particular Chinese women and, and other Asian women that were seen as coming to the United States to engage in prostitution. So that's how we start. That's how immigration law, federal immigration law starts in the United States. It's by exclusion. But even, but even before that first federal attempt, there had already been uh, racial motivated attacks and violent attacks against the Chinese community in the United States. And most notably, the Chinese massacre of 1871 that left 18 dead bodies 
and at least 10 lynched bodies during that massacre. And, and many people don't know that although the lynching experience, it's, it's way more impactful and, and widespread against Blacks in the United States, outside of the South, and the, there was lynching of Native Americans, Latinos, and, and Chinese people, especially in the, in the, in the late um, 19th century. And this is, a, the, this is our photograph from the LA Public Library that has a series on, on, on this event. So even before the Chinese Exclusion Act, this is the, the experience of Chinese communities in the United States had already been barred by, by violence. And the first most com the comprehensive immigration law which is the Chinese Exclusion Act that aimed to exclude from the United States immigration from Chinese that had already come to the United States even through a treaty to work, uh, to, the Ber to the Berlin Treaty to work um, in the United States. The, these are most of these are people that already had permission to come into the United States. And interestingly, this is the first, this is the first of a series of cases that will give, through the Supreme Court opinions, plenary power over immigration to the Congress of the United States. So still today, the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, related cases like Che Xinping are quoted like the basis of the full plenary power that Congress has over, over immigration in the United States. And the discourse against Chinese migration was widespread. So it, not on, it was not only uh, just not the people, it included the American Federation of Labor. The American Federation of Labor went to Congress, and this is actually the first page of their actual presentation and, and of Congress, Meat versus Rice, like American manhood against Asiatic coolies. And it was also present and, and to quote from their, from their presentation that um, we'll see this constant reference regarding health as labeling Asian immigrants as unhealthy or as a disease. So this, this reference to COVID-19 is also very consistent with the way uh, the discourse has worked against Asians in the United States and that, um, that an advancement with an incubus like the Chinese is like the growth of a child with a malignant tumor upon his back. So it's, it's, it's a, there's a constant of this type of, of discourse and imagery against Asian immigrants. Um, a plethora of political cartoons uh, against Chinese immigrants and these are all stereotypes of other immigrants. So it's, or if you're an Irish, you can come in, but also it's also this, uh, depicting the other immigrants in, uh, in derogatory ways. But of all the other immigrants, all the immigrants, if all immigrants are terrible, but Chinese immigrants were particularly the worst of the lot, uh, according, to the, according to, to the discourse. And there was, that also was a discourse supported by the invasion of how large numbers and how the United States was going to be overrun by, by, by Chinese people, which is a similar discourse that we've heard most re more recently against Mexican immigrants and, and recently during the last four years against unaccompanied minors that are coming from the Central American Triangle. So it's a consistent discourse uh, in immigrant. And in this, discourse was also supported by Supreme Court precedent. So, so that's the Supreme Court of the United States in Chai Chan Ping uh, in the 1889 validated the plenary power of immigration, but also the exclusion of Chinese that already had permission to enter the United States. Um, Fong Yutin is also a case related to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, in this, case, in this case, Mr. Ting had a certificate and permission to be in the United States, but he was not able to provide one white witness to corroborate uh, his assertion. Naturalization was also uh, uh, unavailable for, 
for Asian Americans. And that it was not only Chinese, but all Asian Americans, because the naturalization law since 1790 said that naturalization was open to free white persons. And then was extended to black uh, people, but the Supreme Court in the, of the United States goes to great lengths to analyze that Japanese people and Chinese people and Indian people in the case of Finn are not white. That when we say white, we mean Caucasian white, which is also an interesting, converse, different conversation on how we came to with the ca Caucasian term, right? Uh, uh, but that's a different, that's a different conversation. And, and of course, in 1944, um, the Supreme Court in Korematsu uh, condoned the concentration camps for Japanese Americans. The discourse against Asian Americans is also fueled by colonialism, like, like Professor Hughley said. Um, this is a political cartoon of the, around 1898 when the Spanish-American War um, happened and Puerto Rico, Filipinas, Cuba became part of the imperial United States. And if you see in the back, it's the Chinese student not even let, there, it's not even allowed into the school. So we are still going to, you know, civilize this, this group of people that Congress called mongrels. Chinese are even farther away still, even, even at that time. Um, the discourse you will see, it was also from academia. This is an excerpt from uh, a Columbia Law Review, uh, 1901, after the Spanish-American War and how Filipinos are, you know, it, it, it's bringing Filipinos into the, the United States political system would mean the entrance of an inferior race. It was also part of the congressional debate and how we should be beware of those mongrels of the East with breath of pestilence and touch of leprosy. This is the congressional record. Um, not to depress anyone, but this is the discourse. And it was a, a discourse that was widespread that included the media, included Congress, but included academia, included the, the, the Supreme Court of the United States. And that discourse allowed for Korematsu to happen, right? It allowed for the internment of Japanese people in concentration camp camps during the Second World War. And it also prevented any Asian immigration to the United States during the national quotas. So until 1965, um, there was no quota that allowed for Asian immigrants to legally come into the United States. And even after that has changed, the way the immigration system is structured, it impacts disproportionately Asian immigrants. So legal immigration in the United States through the family categories as, as it is in place since 1965 affects disproportionately Asian immigrants. So if you look at that chart, with, and this is an old chart, but it, it's the principle, these are the wait times for people to immigrate legally to the United States through family. And as you see, there are separate categories for China, India, and Filipinas because of the volume uh, of immigration from those countries and the backlog of years of immigration that has not been that has not been processed. In the context of COVID, I didn't want to leave it there. Um, I wanted also to highlight the importance that immigrants have because as I said, COVID is also the disease of transparency. And one of the things that has been highlighted throughout is the importance of immigrant healthcare workers. And within immigrant healthcare workers, particularly physicians and surgeons are mostly Asian immigrants. So right now in the United States, third, close to 30% of all physicians and surgeons are immigrants. Um, the same is true for, certain, for home health care aides, personal care aides, nurses. So 
Interestingly, uh, are immigrants an important part of what we call, you know, the front line and the essential workers? And of those immigrants, increasingly, these are proportions of Asian uh, immigrants that are serving and as the front line and the essential workers, and also disproportionately affected by COVID-19 disease. Does this have to be the, does it have to be this way? And I think that, that and I'm gonna close with, with a quote from Boaventura Santos, who has been writing about, about COVID-19. And one of the things that he says is, is that this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to take this transparency and engage in this conversation and change and make deliberative, intentional changes in the way that we relate to each other um, and, and in the way we let you know, racism and become structural and fight structural inequality. And I think that we can only do it when we work together in, in solidarity and there's you know, no other way. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, now we're going to move on to our last, but not the least, uh, just urban sociology scholar, uh, Dr. Waverly Duck. Um, so first I want to thank you all for um, A, inviting me, but putting together this important panel. Um, I'm honored. I, I think I know everyone on this panel personally, and I have um, have wonderful stories and how your work and your life experiences have informed, you know, my thinking today. Um, I, it's, it's a bit weird for me because I'm an ethnographer that studies face-to-face -face interactions. And so COVID has presented this um, unique opportunity because I, I wish I knew how to turn it off. Um, but understanding where we are at this moment, um, usually I have, I don't have any slides, but I'm going to talk through, and I think it'll be uh, easily followed stream of conscience that's going to dig a rabbit hole that you'll find yourself in. But at the end, I've, hopefully if I do everything right, you'll um, get a sense of how we're all implicated and that this is literally a matter of life and death for a lot of people and that things that you may assume don't impact you actually has an impact. Um, what I've historically done with talks like these is that I usually have like three points, but um, for this talk, and actually I'm gonna time myself so I don't go over time. Um, I have um, just six basic, very easy points to talk about where we are at this particular historical moment and some of the observations I made um, regards to COVID. So I think the, so the, the first point, um, and I'm just going to go through and then I'll talk about them individually and sort of in the life and death, is recognizing that the world has changed, that, you know, this is, um, we're focused in terms of not only in this country, but countries all over the world in dealing with this particular virus. Um, with that being said, there is this sort of natural experiment where things that we used to take for granted, we can no longer take for granted in terms of language, how we do face-to-face -face interactions, that we all had to learn new ways of communicating. Um, I think the third point that I, I want to make is how we started to discover what was happening in our communities and particularly um, how I was hearing about friends and particularly I, I grew up in Michigan, how a number of my Hmong friends were going and experiencing anti-Asian sentiment um, and talking about the sort of the languages and practices around that. And I think the, the last point that I want to make is about um, a double consciousness um, in terms of how one may see themselves. I mean, in this, I, I find this, the, even the category of what somebody is as an Asian that includes, you know, um, East India, China, the Philippines, almost, you know, anywhere from a third to probably about half of the world's population is collapsed in this category. And so how people see themselves um, within and between groups, and then how that's used to discriminate against people, um, and what the response is. And then I'm going to just end it all with how this is a matter of life and death. 
So let's um, get into it. So the what's exciting, and I, and I must acknowledge that you know a hundred thousand people have died, uh, millions of people have lost their lives across the world. It has you know really brought the world to a standstill. Um, and I think for those of us who study the world and particularly face-to-face -face interactions, it becomes really important to make the ordinary strange. And what I mean by that is looking at the new ways that people are creating social reality, whether it's in their Zoom meetings or if you're essential workers or um, just your interactions on the street of how are you learning this new way of life? You know, where do you get it? You're not reading rules. You, you may pick up this at the supermarket, you may pick up this on the street. What does it mean in terms of your new identity while you're sheltering in place? I think for me, I've become very aware of how I'm extremely privileged in relationship to you know, my working class relatives. As one of my brothers said, you know, either he works or he starves. Um, Okay, I think we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. All right, let's give a moment. Well, technology is great, but you now until it works. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, let's, uh, uh, I have a few questions actually that came in. So until, uh, you know, Waverly uh, gets back to, uh, like with a more stable internet connection, uh, like let me go to, like, let me go to some of the questions that were posted uh, through the Q&A and chat room. Uh, one thing is, uh, like this question is for Doug Ewan, and this is from Karen, and she's an Asian American, and oftentimes I do not have the energy or desire to educate friends on why certain statements, actions are racist or microaggressive toward Asian black folks. Like, what are some responses I can say towards uh, these friends? Uh, like this is a question that I get all the time as well. Like I don't have good answers. <laughs> so you and like it, like what, like what do you think? So um, I get this as well, and I also don't have good answers. So I can commiserate a bit. And I was wondering if maybe Dr. Hughley actually may have some good responses and resources. But um, the thing that I think is really interesting is when it is people who regard themselves as your friends, right? So it's like oh, I'm close enough with you that I can say this racist thing to you and we will enjoy it together. And I find that very difficult to respond to. But, and so I would, I'd like to learn myself how that can be effectively addressed. Yes, like a, I'm <laughs> opening up for like a Jay <laughs> and Shayla you, but, as well. But I have a feeling that you might um, have greater expertise at this. Yeah, I don't know if I do either. Um, I'll take a shot at it though. Well, I think first thing I would I would say is really just to validate that you know what what we would call racial battle fatigue is real. Like you get tired, you don't you don't fight every battle. And in fact, when I'm dealing with my when I'm when I'm uh, with my students, I um, and I'm trying to mentor students for their careers. You know, that's a conversation that comes up because they feel like after a while they're getting worn out, like with all the racial battles they feel like they have to fight. Sorry about that. Oh, Waverly's, Waverly's back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, uh, another byproduct of the internet being <laughs> times of COVID, which um, thank God teaching has sort of uh, prepared me for um, this where I gotta get back to my. Okay, so we're gonna go back to Waverly. Uh, and look, we, I think we cut off right at the, uh, like, whether you work or starve. That was the last sentence uh, I think we oh, heard. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> now I have to take my, my entire, uh, give me one second. And we'll come back to uh, Jay like, you know, oh, yeah, for so, your um, answers later on. I mean, I think one of the things that sort of, and I, I um, keep this um, short and sweet, I think one of the things of realizing, you know, not only 
uh, where you are in terms of relationship to other people, um, but also, you know, friends all over the world of how are they coping and managing. And then I think this becomes a really important point about um, that we're all in this situation together and that there needs to be a certain level of trust and reciprocity, where it may not appear that anti-Asian sentiment or anti-Black sentiment or any type of sort of racism doesn't impact you, but the, the thought of um, you know, hospitals being closed down, food chains being disrupted, people in our communities who we need to participate, not feeling really safe, becomes extremely important. And then I think the other issue that cannot be downplayed is how people see themselves. Um, and I'm going to do something really creative in talking about just, you know, one of the beautiful things about growing up in Michigan is that, you know, had a, a number of friends from a diverse background, but hearing some of the challenges that some of my Hmong friends were dealing with, with anti-Asian sentiment. So what happened? Uh, coronavirus spread, most people were quarantined, but it reshaped the way that we do just ordinary life and the ways that we talk to each other. And this is what um, a sociologist named um, Harold Garfinkel calls a natural, a natural experiment, where all the things that we used to take for granted are no longer in play. And we actually get to see the things that we've historically taken for granted. I speculate that there is a lot of self-reflection um, that has happened in these past few months of quarantining, but it also exposes some of those, um, that historical residue and some current contemporary things about how we think about inequality along the lines of race, class, and gender. So being very much aware of looking at interactions between people become really significant and there are very few sort of staging places. And I think the supermarket is one, um, how people are interacting, social distancing. So this natural experiment, paying attention becomes extremely important. Um, the checking in, for the first time, you know, um, I think there's a ritual of asking people, how are you? But for the first time, I think that statement, instead of saying people, I'm fine, well, and you know, how are you? I think for the first time in a long time, you're actually getting accurate depictions of what people are experiencing, both psychologically and physically. And we're reconnecting with people we haven't talked to in years, or at least I'm speculating based on the people who I've been talking to. And so then it becomes even much more complex of, you know, asking people if they're sick, um, you know, and then this sort of realization of how, you know, fortunate, and right now I feel very fortunate to have a job, um, to be able to work from home, to be able to shelter in place, but recognizing that that isn't the case for a lot of people, or even realizing that depending upon your accumulation of wealth, your relationship to COVID seems to be sort of shaped by that. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna fast forward to um, talking about sort of, you know, how we're all in it together um, and realizing how different communities are making sense. I had an aunt who was diagnosed with COVID and it was really difficult because she's 86, she had to go into the hospital and even working through the language of a ventilator versus a respirator, a non-invasive one, and the potential of what was gonna to happen to her, even just working out those details within families and asking how people are doing, which brings me to some of the issues and this anti-Asian sentiment that we're seeing at this moment in time. Um, I look at a lot of my um, friends and family and I have a, a friend of mine who's Hmong to ask me if her brother should buy a gun. Um, because he doesn't feel safe, because there are people who are, you know, um, breaking social distancing guidelines and blaming him um, for the coronavirus, and how this sort of rhetoric, you know, has a long history. Um, I think Sheila points out very well, like, the history of anti-Chinese sentiment, but this isn't our first time at the rodeo. Like, when the um, the bubonic plague happened in 1900 in um, San Francisco, uh, fumigated, uh, blamed the Chinese for filth and immorality. And then instead of using sort of a public health, um, you know, way of dealing with things, it was also just blaming that particular group of people. And then after the earthquake in 1906, I believe, 1905 or 1906, it became more seen as a public health crisis. What I mean to say is that it becomes a distraction over the issues that we have to deal with. In one sense, this 
man sees himself as a Hmong man, not as Asian, not as Chinese, but him in a particular way. But then this sort of historical residue of anti-Asian sentiment that has a particular shape depending upon your history in this country, uh, whether it's your food sensibilities, whether it's your country of origin, or whether who we're having conflict, all of that stuff can be invoked to point out that you have sort of a provisional status in terms of who and what you are in terms of your rights and privileges. Which brings me to my last point, how this is a matter of life and death. Um, I worry about um, people because I'm in the world with, you know, people who are doing anti-lockdown protests, um, people who are um, being discriminated against because it, how that impacts them, whether it's a run on the hospitals, whether it's a disruption of the food chain, whether it's causing people who we need to cooperate not to cooperate has implications. And even the language that we're using now that we've never used before from PPE to flattening the curve to herd immunity, we still see even race and you know, you know, past tragedies sort of loaded in those terms from sheltering in place with um, school shootings um, to um, how we seem to sort of make it a, um, go from a racial to a cultural issue. So I'm saying this all to say that this moment in time is traumatic for a lot of people and sort of dealing with and watching how certain segments of our population are being discriminated against and thinking that it doesn't have anything to do with you is problematic in and of itself. That it actually, we're all in this together. Um, and it may impact us in a number of ways. And so I think we're still in sort of the midst of it, but this history of anti-Asian sentiment is, you know, it, it's like a mini headed hydra. It's, it's situated for all Asian groups that can be a vote to discriminate against somebody who doesn't even see themselves in that particular way. But again, Racism doesn't have that sort of specificity. It doesn't matter. You know, you become flattened into this category. So I'm going to end there. I apologize for um, my, my shaky internet, but uh, thank you for being patient and uh, sticking through with this. Well, it is not your fault that your internet like, is a shaky. Uh, now, like all four of you, uh, the, the great uh, panelists, uh, you know, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I think... Like we have a uh, you know a number of different angles uh, in terms of uh, looking at look at this issue, and I think it is a like, great let's say like you know combination. So uh, some of you kind of provided sort of a kind of uh, framework uh, like how like it kept basically taught us how to look at it and how we can actually understand it. Like we're all academics and. Of course, like there are tons of people who are not actually in academia who like to actually understand what's going on. Like, why is this happening? And I think uh, you know we actually got a good input in terms of like that uh, perspective. But at the same time, like we, I think like it was a great education as you know, even for me that like you know, being an Asian American. Uh, you know, lived through uh, a lot of kind of instances that were talked about, like still it is a great education of what other people are experiencing and what is actually going on in the society in general. Uh, get, let me kind of like share one experience that I had, which was uh, like a long time ago in the 60s, I grew up in St. Louis. So as a small kid, uh, you know, walking around on, like, in the town, uh, uh, there was a very nice old lady who approached my mom, who was well, like, with me at the time, and asked, pointing at me, and asked her, like, what is that? It was not, who is that? Or, no, like, it was, and, no, like, and I still remember that moment very vividly. I don't have that many memories of, like, at that age. Like, I think I was four at the time. Uh, but I still remember that uh, kind of moment. And it was not about like or her being a bad person or like, you know, she was a hostile or anything. Like she was a really, really nice lady. Uh, but for her, I was just an object, right? Like a very peculiar object, right? And I don't think it has changed that much uh, in 
uh, and it kind of gives us uh, like an opportunity like uh, to kind of look at it with you know one step back and uh, think about okay like what is the kind of like root cause of everything that is going on and I find it really uh, like interesting to hear all your thoughts uh, now like let's go back to like uh, the point of some people who are trying to kind of help others understand the situation and kind of help them a little bit, help them uh, like not to make the same kind of mistakes, right? So the question was, hey, like, you know, but, like how, like why certain statements, actions are racist or microaggressive? Like how do I explain it to others? And uh, like Jay was in the middle of answering uh, get the question and kind of giving some uh, get insights. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, I, I spoke to validating racial battle fatigue. Like, you're not going to, you're probably not going to fight every battle. Um, and, but when you, when you do choose to fight, you know, I mean, you're talking about interpersonal dynamics. So I would say your response is going to be very different depending on that person, your relationship with them, what you know they're willing to hear. And then, you know, are they harming someone in, in, in that moment that you need to intervene? So if someone is about to say something racist to somebody else in your circle or in an encounter or you're, the, you're there for it, maybe you feel compelled to kind of aggressively, you know, step in and, and say, that's not okay. We can't tolerate that here. If you think someone has a racist misunderstanding, maybe that's, a, maybe that's I'm going to pull you aside in the second moment and, and break that down for you. Um, and, or maybe someone who's just not being, not really thinking about it and you can just kind of be like, come on, that's, that's not okay. And it depends on the dynamic and in that moment, but, uh, I want to loop this in with another question that someone, John asked and, um, you know, he spoke to how he can be an advocate as a white person for other people and, and people of color in his friend group. And I think if some of these similar dynamics play out, you can be an advocate by, by disrupting it in other in other circles where people of color may not be able to be there, you don't have to disrupt. You don't have to necessarily try to engage your friends of color in comforting them with racism uninvited. You know, if if you see what's happening on the news, you don't necessarily have to, you know, feel obligated to go in and do something directly with them to let them know you're there or things like that. They they can come to you and know you're you're someone they can count on in another in another fashion, but don't feel that kind of obligation. But I think what we can all do, whatever whether it's in a moment or in general, is get involved in anti racist work. And that can be in your parenting. What are the children's books in your in your own? What are you exposing your children to? Uh, are those diverse? Are you teaching them about the histories of race and systemic racism in the United States. Those are anti-racist acts, as well as getting involved in campaigns and activities and donating to causes. So there's a wide range of things that are going to move the needle. What you say in a, in a given moment is part of that, and, but, it, but there's a much, much bigger picture of that uh, as a white person and as a person. No, so I can hear, I think, like, this is a little bit of, like, a really a broad question where, like, what we can do, like, individually, like, uh, to basically remedy, like, the situation, right? Now, like, sometimes, like, I, like, try to speak up, but it is, like, the perception of, and like, the whole message gets uh, perceived based on who I am, right? So like the speaker, the identity of the speaker matters. Uh, so like, let me go to Shayla uh, you know, like as uh, like somebody who looked really into the Puerto Rican and also the Caribbean immigration and all the struggles that they have gone through uh, and all the discriminations they experienced. So like, you know, what kind of lessons we can learn from that and basically apply to the Asian American situation that we're experiencing these days? So, so I think that, that that goes back to something that, that James, said, James said at the beginning and, and that also Waverly, Waverly said, we are all, we are all people of color. Our experience are shared experiences. And 
I can, and, and, and in my writing, for example, when, when I was looking at how I found all the discourse against Filipino Americans and Filipinos during, after Hispanic American War, because I was researching the same type of language against Puerto Ricans and Cubans when the Spanish American War happened. And, and by reading that, and reading the full text of the congressional records and the Columbia Law Review, Harvard Law Review, and Yale Law Review articles from the era, it's the same discourse. So, so we, so this is this is a discourse of otherness and inferiority uh, that has been imposed on all of us across the board. And the main issue, and and I and I think that we can't get too distracted because the, the, the main issue is an issue of hetero hetero patriarchy, I mean, of, of colonialism, uh, racism, um, and capitalism also, because all this sort of serves the, the way capitalism is structured and, and organized, and it feeds from subordination. So it, it requires all of us to start looking at this from a broader lens of anti-subordination across the board and and also learn from our shared experiences through events like this so we can all say okay this is all of us right and it will take all of us so doc Waverly, doc and you and would you like to add uh, some of your thoughts um I think what Shayla mentioned and what I really appreciated about her talk, but I think all the talks is sort of situating this in um, a history and a discourse um, that I think becomes really important, but also I think is extremely important to pay attention to language. And I, I don't think this point can be downplayed. I find it fascinating that a virus that is spread face to face um, has sort of created this, um, this sort of this fear and this sort of tension but also how false claims become a distraction to sort of push a narrative forward. Um, and and I, I say this all to say is that I think, again, this is an important historical moment in terms of recognizing what's going on, but you know, thinking about how we're gonna move forward. And I think there's a certain level of uncertainty that we need to deal with, but I think what's different at this particular historical moment is that we have enough people with knowledge about these sort of past transgressions and that I speculate that we should know better um, and in terms of you know demonizing people but it also it brings into question of you know our Americanness like what does it mean to be an American um, that I think needs to be interrogated and unpacked um, and you know and sort of you know the rights and privileges that people have in a moment that I, I cannot <laughs> I can and it's it's mind I mean to me um, in a moment where people are losing their lives. This is a matter of life and death. And I think this, you know, um, and I cannot, I don't want to marginalize and downplay the racism that a lot of my, um, you know, that a lot of people of color in general are experiencing. Um, but I also think, again, the only way, and I'm not sure who ended their talk with this, uh, I think it, um, that we got to get through this together. Like there's no, there, there's this moment where we need coordinated action and focused attention to just transition to whatever the new normal is going to be. Okay, thank you. Uh, you want, do you want to uh, chime in a little bit? Um, so I just wanted to say that I agree with everything that Shayla and Waverly said. And um, I think it's important to recognize that when we think about hate crimes, I mean, they're just at one end of a continuum, right? I mean, this is all the social environment and it just manifests in different ways. And, um, and so we need to recognize that daily interactions, mundane interactions do affect the social environment and have a role in um, influencing the more extreme forms, right? It does become a matter of life and death because everything is so connected. So, um, so I really appreciate um, that we're all coming at this from different perspectives, but kind of saying a very um, consistent thing, which is we're all in this together, right? And a lot of this has to do with how people view their place in society and 
how they protect it, how they keep others from um, being able to have the advantages that they have. Um, so I, we really do need to recognize all the connections. All right, thank you. Now, like, like we were talking, like this whole discussion kind of got bigger and bigger, but we started out with a question uh, like from Karen, who was an Asian American, like, okay, how do I explain? How I explain is uh, you know, like anything that is racist, like uh, to my friends when they actually don't get it. Now, there is a, like, another question from John, and that's like a, like a similar question, but in a little bit different kind of perspective. He's a white male, and he like, like, wants to be a good father. He has three young kids, and he wants to be a good father. He wants to like, you know, show them, like, uh, you know, lead them by examples. Uh, but he's not Asian American, right? So again, at the same time, there are like a question from, uh, the, like, like, uh, let me try to find it. Oh, yes, so I get a question from another like, anonymous like, a person who basically asked, like, okay, as a bystander, as a bystander, like I'm not Asian American, but like when I see like a, some sort of, uh, let's say harassment or anything, like uh, happening, like when I witness that, like how do I actually intervene? Like what can I do to help? So let's go to uh, Kieran Shaler, like you first, uh, because uh, you probably have a lot of cases that uh, like, uh, under your belt, basically that dealt with these things. So I, one one thing that that I have learned to do, and how I and there's there's several questions on the thread about how do you deal with this um, directly. And uh, it's, it's really hard for people that, be, that make a racist comment to see that they hurt you on and they are more defensive if, if you identify that yourself. So I usually say, you know that some people might find this to be racist or that some people might find it to be offensive in such and such way. And let me give you an example on how that could be interpreted by some people as offensive. And most people, I mean, that are intelligent and want to be better, will welcome a conversation from that perspective. Um, so, so that's a tool and a way, uh, and a way of doing it. There, I mean, we're all racist in one way or another because we have been all social. We have been all socialized in a racist society, and we're a product of our culture. So to stop being racist requires, and a tremendous deliberative eff uh, effort. And, and deliberative, not in the not only because we need to talk about it and discuss it, but it's also a deliberate effort. That it's an effort that has to be intentional. And it has to be of liberation. So, so, so it, it's really hard. I mean, the easy thing is to be racist. That is the easy thing. What it's difficult is to break from that. And when you're a parent, you have to invest in not being racist. And let me give you the, the thing that we're dealing with in our house right now. So Pittsburgh Public Schools, it's teaching about Johnny Appleseed and or John Chapman and how he planted the trees to make the nation grow. And I'm here pulling my hairs. So it, it is a, a, an effort to say, you know, Lucia, this is just a legend and a perspective, for, but this is all that was happening also. And you have to educate and you have to offer a counter narrative all the time. And it never stops. It will never stop. You will have to be to do this for the rest of your life. It will never stop. So basically, it is the diligence that pays off, right? Uh, now, like we're actually like with all the lively discussions, like we're kind of running like you know, out of time. And uh, like you know, Jay just posted a link to a bystander guide on the chat win in the chat window. So I like, could, uh, you know, if anybody who's interested in that, please. Uh, to uh, go to the link later after the session is over. Now, like, here are some of the other questions that got in, and uh, I think it is uh, the question. There is a kind of like common thread among the questions about how do we uh, 
kind of this, uh, you know, talk about this with, uh, uh, you know, white peers. Uh, and how do we gen- uh, basically, you know, talk, help them become an ally? Like in this whole uh, the series of uh, webinars, it, it is about allyship, right? So how do we actually get there? Uh, you know, uh, let's start with you, Wayne. Like, what are your thoughts or advices on that one? So um, one thing that Shayla said, I think, is a helpful thing, um, maybe, for approaching these discussions. And that is, I think that if I heard correctly, what Shayla said is that recognizing that we're all racist is actually kind of liberating. I mean, it's not certainly a good thing to be a racist, but to recognize that's kind of the human condition is to be a racist, I think helps people to get past the sort of stigma of thinking that being a racist is actually deviant, right? Being a racist is normal and is something that um, I think people want in general not to be, right? Um, And so I think being able to explain these dynamics in um, ways that are understandable to people in ways that maybe parallel experiences they've had in situations when they weren't part of the privileged group, right? And sort of um, show analogies between that situation and um, what's happening when they are part of a privileged group and are saying something um, that is racist or behaving in a way that is racist. I think that can help. I mean, that's what I try to do is um, present things in a way where people can relate and be like, oh, yes, I have had that experience and I I can understand what you're talking about, right? And I can see that this doesn't make me a bad person. It just makes me a flawed person, which means I'm just a person. Um, So I I think that's a really important thing to do. I think the other thing that um, we need to recognize, though, is that we all have different kinds of privilege. And one thing that's really hard to get past is enjoying your own privilege, right? When it is um, in contrast to or at the expense of someone else. And that's kind of the distancing thing that I was talking about. That's one of the harmful effects of hate crimes is when you can distinguish yourself from a group that is targeted. I mean, that actually gives you a bit of a boost, right? They've um, shown, you know, that the converse of stereotype threat in a test taking situation is the stereotype boost that um, white people can get or that men can get. And I think that um, that is a really hard thing to overcome because sometimes being aware of your own privilege actually can make you embrace it a little bit and enjoy it a little bit too much. And so, um, so that I think is a challenge in having these discussions with people who generally don't feel like they are uh, in a targeted group. So yes, I, hope- uh, I, 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 I find it really interesting. And uh, like, yeah. let me kind of add one yeah. more kind of like flavor to that, which is the, mo- the, the, the model minority kind of label that Asian Americans uh, can normally get. So Jay pointed out, uh, pointed, uh, pointed out some interesting insights about that as well earlier. But because uh, you know, we have uh, that kind of stereotype like imposed upon us as a model minority, uh, there's a lot of times that uh, there's a kind of like a mixed responses that we're going to get, right? Because sometimes people look at us and, hey, like, you know, like, why are you complaining about anything? Like, you shouldn't. Or, or like, uh, some people uh, could consider actually Asians as uh, the most racist people because, like, oh, yeah, like, you think you're above everybody else, like a type of uh, like a notion. Now, how do we kind of uh, kind of like, kind of come to a kind of common ground, right? Like on that part, like on, uh, you know, where we, like we are and where we stand in this country, because even with the model minority notion, uh, Asian Americans have never been uh, uh, accepted to the like, uh, like so-called, like, you know, right? Like in uh, to this society, we are always considered as foreign, right? So okay. Waverly, like you were, I mean, okay, so one of the things that I, I, I want to jump in and tie into two points, and actually this one, 
Um, I think so much of this is structural. So much of this is embedded in our language. And I think, you know, one of the things that I tried to open up with is like, once you make the ordinary strange, the taken for granted strange, it becomes visible. And one can speculate that we won't do that thing anymore um, in terms of highlighting how this marginalized people. And I think the, and even pointing out that we've all had moments where we've been discriminated against, but sometimes there are people who deal with it or have those experiences more so than others on a day-to-day -day and everyday life. Um, the model minority thing is, again, making the ordinary strange. Model minority compared to whom? Um, and who, who are we, you know, talking about? And then it, once you start going down that rabbit hole, you start to see the social construction of race and how these things are perpetuated and play out. Um, and that again, you think this, you know, that it, rec you know, it represents this sort of provisional status that, you know, whether it was during 9-11, how, you know, we had to recalibrate Arabs and their whiteness, or, you know, how at this particular historical moment, um, you know, uh, a lot of people of Asian descent um, are dealing with anti-Asian sentiment and particularly anti-Chinese sentiment that has in itself in this country a long particular history. And so I think what I, what I would say is to sort of interrogate those language regimes, interrogate how these things work structurally, what is the recourse and how are these things able to work in everyday life? I think it's important that we have two attorneys on this panel because we see how it works within a law. Um, and so there's ways of looking at practices and languages, uh, practice and language and the ways that we talk about people, not only ourselves, but in relationship to other people. And, and, and I might add that this concept of model minority is in itself a trap. Because it, it is a trap because once you use it, you are validating the premise of minorities being lesser, right? Of, of the other being bad, they all, and, and you validate the, that premise that it is, that sits on all the discourse that we have been, that we have been covering and all that history of exclusion, discrimination, all that history of oppression. So that's the trap. By you, by trying to use that as a platform, you are, it, it is a validation of all that. So we need to really deconstruct and destruct that premise. And, and not even engage in that conversation of modeling and, and who decides. And, and, and it's also giving power to, to white supremacy to decide what is, what is good, what is socially acceptable. So all that has to be dismounted. And I think this is implicit maybe in what Waverly and Shayla just said, but um, I just want to say it explicitly. I think it's also a trap in the sense that Asians can... Um, actually kind of take pride in it sometimes in a very perverse way, right? That then promotes the myth. And I think that might have been implicit in what you were saying. And so um, just to recognize that actually it's not a good thing, right? To be um, labeled a model minority, um, which is something that, you know, I have some older relatives who actually don't understand that this is not a good thing. Um, so, you know, it, it's very tricky. Oh, like, just, yeah, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, we under, I think we tend to underestimate how little people know in this country about actual racial history in this country. And one of the things I think we can do is make sure we educate ourselves on what has transpired in this world. You know, one of the questions we ask at the center of our students is if you don't talk about race, how do you explain racial inequality? Quality. And that's where many, many people in the United States are. They don't talk about race, but they want to make some kind of working assumption around inequality. And usually that assumption is racist. And so we can educate ourselves in that way. And with the model minority piece, if you understand the racial history of this country, including racism against Asian Americans and all of the mechanisms that have systematically worked to disempower people economically, socially to create the, the, to create the hierarchy that we have today, when we have a crisis like this, it's not a surprise that that underlying racial current comes back into play. And I think one resource I would highlight is the Ibram Kendi book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, simply because I think it's very, very accessible 
and it gives people and white people language that is very accessible to understand the dynamics of race and be able to communicate that. And I do believe the this or the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has them coming here um, in July too. So that's great. All right. Uh, so I could I could thank you so much, everyone. Like now we are actually right at one thirty, but uh, I think like we can go a little bit longer. Uh, if that is okay, like, and uh, I think that anybody who wants to uh, leave because they have other obligations, like, you know, that is fine. Uh, but like, uh, this is not a kind of like everyday moment that we have these like great people in the same Zoom chat room. So <laughs> I'm gonna try to kind of hang on to it a little bit longer. And like, uh, so like, in terms of the conversation about this whole. Uh, you know, Asian American, uh, you know, issue that came to the surface. And I think we all agree that like the problem was there like in the past, it has always been there. It just came to the surface. Uh, now I think it probably is a kind of, uh, you know, wake up call for a lot of people like who basically bought into that whole model minority mm -hmm. uh, you know, definition. Uh, including the Asian Americans who bought into that too. I mean, I think there are a lot of Asian Americans uh, like, in a way that were a little bit complacent in terms of like fighting racism or things like that because of that whole label that was put on to us. Now, uh, there was a question uh, from the audience uh, that actually asked us about like what Pitt is doing. Uh, so, like, what are the kind of things that Pitt is doing in terms of our like, university or like each schools? Uh, we have uh, you know, uh, three different schools uh, like represented, including like you know, four, including the business school mm -hmm. I'm from. Uh, so, what are the things that we are doing or we can do to make uh, our Oakland campus or like all okay? Like a city of Pittsburgh, to that matter, like a lot safer place and a lot more inclusive place. Anyone who wants to kind of say something that our central administrators are not going to be happy to hear about? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think this is, um, I think there are a couple things that we need to think about in terms of um, how our, how these things are structured in terms of, you know, in, in one sense that Pitt is not a monolithic place, that you have um, students, you have faculty, you have staff, and I think those issues um, have different workings, but think about what is to be done when um, a, a, a complaint about racism comes up and how do we, um, how do we handle those issues? What are, what are we doing as an institution in terms of educating the public, but also keep in mind, you know, how do we create a much more inclusive environment? Um, the demographics of this country is rapidly changing, and I speculate that Pitt is going to be a qualitatively different place 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now. And so I think thinking about being ahead of the curve in terms of having these really meaningful conversations about all forms of discrimination um, and not flattening. Um, I also think there's something we need to think about sort of um, recourse um, in terms of how do we deal with these grievances um, at an institutional level. Um, I think, you know, and again, I, 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 you know, it's an academic institution, so paying attention to how even within our structure um, how we do hiring, how we do recruiting, how we, um, you know, support people who are, you know, who have been historically marginalized, who have this weight upon them um, to sort of educate the public in addition to trying to do your job. And I think that cannot um, sort of be downplayed right now, that there are things that institutions can do at the student level, at the sort of administrative level, um, but also just in, in, you know, making the general public aware of um, some of the things that we do. And we have this panel of amazing, um, you know, critical race and race scholars 
um, who have a lot of insights and work and they're, and they're very approachable. So I, I think it's, it's like, a, again, it has these many parts that can be, um, that can be changed and addressed. Um, and, I, and I think the Office of Diversity and Inclusion was a step in the right direction, but again, giving it teeth um, in terms of the hiring, recruitment, students, and what have you. All right. Uh, yeah, you want, do you want to I jump in? Say that I agree with everything that Waverly said, and I think that um, a lot of efforts are being made. I know at the School of Law um, that we're paying a lot of attention. We're creating a new associate dean position to really, uh, and you know, if there's going to be a fantastic person in charge of that effort at the School of Law. Um, and I think that one of the really important things for those of us who are in a position to have influence on the institution um, should um, sort of recognize is that we should try not to be afraid to talk about these issues, right? It's actually, it makes it scarier if you can't talk about them. Um, and so, you know, I'm really so glad that, um, that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Health Sciences Diversity Office are opening up these discussions. I know the Center on Race, likewise, is always talking about these issues and um, just making it more normal to talk about these issues, I think, is really important. All right, on the same line, like, let me, uh, you know, throw another question, like, this related question to, like, everybody. Uh, this is actually from the question of Alaya. Uh, I hope that I'm not mispronouncing your name. But her, uh, her question is, how do we keep ourselves from being distracted, like, by all the things going on in terms of politics, right? So, like, uh, suddenly the whole social issue and uh, the politics are kind of, like, you know, tangled up, like as sort of like a single issue, like a mo uh, in uh, many cases. Now they're not supposed to be a single issue, like you know the whole uh, you know, social issues, and especially the, the racial issues that we're talking about. Those are about right versus wrong. Now politics is about like difference of opinions, right? Like they're supposed to be different. So how do we actually kind of disentangle them, uh, and how do we not get distracted? Uh, yeah, by like everything going on in the politics. Like I'll start with Jay, the, uh, because you have probably more experience on this like, than <laughs> like I do. I'm gonna say a couple of things, but I think Shayla has done such a great job like laying out how law, which are laws are created by politics. If we're talking about governmental politics and not like social definition of politics. Uh, is in the you know the, the fabric of our of our of our systems um, have racial strong racial uh, mechanisms, and I don't think you can disentangle race and politics. Uh, I think politics have always supported racial subordination and hierarchies in the United States. So I mean, first of all, people didn't have the right to vote for many years of, of people of color. You have. Um, you have representation in American governing bodies being determined at the, at the origin through racist policies around slavery and three-fifths compromise. Uh, you have very active attempts to disenfranchise people of color from voting even right now. That's an active and it's succeeding uh, endeavor in, in different parts of the country. So I really don't make much of an effort to try to disentangle issues of race from issues of politics. I think that you're not going to be able to do that. I mean, obviously, the, re the rhetoric coming from the leadership of the country, whether it be overt or uh, implied, it has a lot of, it is very racial. And so um, I just think it's, a, it, it's false to think you can, you can disentangle those things. All right, uh, let, let's go to Waverly. Like, you know, can you kind of add some more insights on that? I mean, you know, it's like a, a, a horrible Venn diagram where that sweet spot of politics and anti-anything um, becomes sort of eclipsed. And I, I think, again, um, this sort of history can be evoked. I mean, I, you know, um, being in Pittsburgh and watching the Tree of Life shooting. Um, at this particular moment, you know, checking on my friends and, you know, where you're worried about not only contracting the virus and keeping your family safe and worrying about your economic 
um, prospects, you now have to worry about your safety. Um, and it's totally a political issue and it's distracting. Um, and, 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 and what I mean by it, it distracts you from, you know, doing the things that you need to do, but it's also very hurtful, you know, to, to be born in a country, to grow up in a place, and then to be the target of very pointed, you know, racism. And I think anyone who sort of traffics in that sort of behavior, I think we just have to highlight. And I think politics um, sort of creates these, you know, situations. And it has been this way historically. Um, and I think Shayla did a wonderful job at explaining sort of this, this history that, um, that, you know, this language that has been used and it, and it comes up over and over and over again. And it's not only happening in this country, but it's happening in other parts of the world as well. And so I think there is, it becomes really hard to decouple the two because by its definition, it was a political category that was created to keep people separated or subordinated in the first place. And so it's extremely complex, but it's very hard to sort of decouple the two um, for particular groups, because there's a particular orderliness that um, racism has for different populations that can be evoked. All right, thank and, you so much. Uh, okay, like, now, like, let's go a little bit deeper, and this is going to be our last question. Okay, Jay, Jay go ahead. I've got to take off, but it's been great, and I thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time, Jay. Now, like, this is going to be our very last question, and I'm going to hand over to Mario to uh, go close out to the event. Uh, and uh, thank you for everybody who is still sticking with us. I see there are still tons of participants uh, that are watching like, this webinar. Now, the last question is a little bit kind of tricky because uh, there is, has been uh, quite a bit of tension between uh, African-American and Asian communities like, in uh, the U.S. Now, like, that is not helping in this kind of particular uh, you know, point of time uh, right now because as you can see like a lot of videos posted about Asian Americans uh, getting harassed, getting attacked, uh, like sometimes the, the, it is the other minority groups attacking them, like including African Americans. Uh, now, like, for example, there's a question from Gary that, who pointed out that like there was a black protest against Chinese and Asian merchants in response to China's human rights violation and mistreatment of African residents in Guangzhou. Now, like this complicates things, of course, but like how do we actually bridge like, a, like a, this, or let's say kind of ease the tension, right? Like between African Americans and uh, uh, Asian communities. So, so I, I, I attempted to, to answer that question in, in, in the chat, but I'll be, I'll be happy to, to, to say what I was trying to, with what I was trying to engage is that um, there's only one way to deal with racism and it needs a collective effort, right? So it, it, it has to be dealt with collective, collectively and we, lean, we need to learn from each other's experiences. We need to know each other. We need to work with each other. That is an enormous effort. That, that, that is a great effort. That doesn't mean that we are not going to denounce when we're at fault because we are all product of our society and we are going to be at fault. And when we are at fault, that has to be denounced. And if it's a, it's, and there has all, there has been for, for years some discourse between the uh, tensions between Latinos and, and African Americans, for example, for the role that Latinos might have played in labor. This is very manufactured, right? So, so this is a, a manufactured problem and that only serves to allow the systems, the interconnected systems of oppression to continue. So we have to denounce ourselves, we have to denounce it, but we also need to work together. So it requires both things. So it requires the recognition of fault, but that can't mean that we won't be able to engage in working together. So it's a challenge, um, but that's, from my perspective, the only way forward. All right, so we are officially 15 minutes over time, uh, but uh, it, it has been 
a great hockey experience for me. Like I learned a lot. It was a very, uh, you know, educational uh, in terms of understanding the structure, understanding the perspectives and uh, the historical and the social uh, the, like, implications. Like it, it's like, this is an issue that I think people really have to take a step back and uh, think about. Uh, okay, as an Asian American, uh, this is like, I have to confess that these days, it is the first time that I'm actually looking over my shoulder whenever I am out there on the street. Uh, I didn't have to do that ever, but now it has become a habit. Uh, it is part of my going outside, right? So uh, okay, thank you so much for all your insights, uh, all the great panelists. And uh, at the same time, like uh, thank you, Mario and uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, like for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand over to Mario to close. Uh, you know, thank you so much for your great facilitation. I wanna thank the panelists again. Nothing else to be said at this point, except I hope that we will continue the dialogue at some point. Um, thank you for your willingness to stay over. I think we could probably go another half hour uh, based on the number of people that are still in there. Um, I just want to share the screen really quick and uh, make people aware that we will have two more um, town halls under allyship and advocacy in the age of COVID-19. Our next will be Codes of Belief in COVID-19, Faith in an Age of Pandemic. I know one of our attendees asked about the religious and spiritual uh, component to this. Uh, so we will do that on June 12th, on June 10th, I'm sorry. And the last, probably won't be the last, but the uh, town hall following that will be holes in the safety net, the forgotten needs of people with disabilities under quarantine, and that will be on June 24th. So please look for those and please register. I hope you all will attend. Thank you for coming and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much.